We've been talking on the first five consciousnesses. Who am I? What's this identity? It's a combination of body and the mind. The body is a physiological system, and the mind is the consciousness. Uh, vichnana. Vichnana is a Sanskrit word. So by now, we should well know that Buddhism is not a, a, a faith. It's not a blind faith. Uh, the Buddha said, in order to meditate, you must know how your mind works. You must know how your mind works in order to meditate. Uh, you can just sit there and meditate and, and don't know what's going on in the consciousness. So Buddhism is not a, a faith, it's not a blind faith, it's a study of your mind. In one sect of Buddhism, which, which is the, which Nana Matrata, is the study of one's own mind. So we've been doing that for a long time. So right now we continue and continue. We, we, we started with the first five consciousnesses first, and then we will study the sixth consciousness, which is the Manu consciousness, and then we will study the seventh consciousness, which is the Manas consciousness, and then the eighth, which is the Alaya consciousness. So right now we are still in the first five. So. We know that the body, we have the eyes, the ears, the nose, and the tongue. And then the body, we have hairs, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, veins, bone structures, liquid in bone and internal organs, and all these, the body. Uh, which include, of course, the intestines, the, uh, um, the heart, the blood, the circulation, everything, that's the body. Right? Why don't we put eyes, ears, nose, tongue at the front end because they are the sensory organs that interact with externalities. So that's the reason why uh, we put them in the forefront so that we, we study the first five consciousness in detail. And then of course we have the brain uh, which is connected to the perception of it, the, the consciousness. So the body and the mind is connected together with, by the brain. The brain connects the body and the mind together. The perception first, with the vision, the hearing, the smell, the taste and the touch, which is exactly what vision relates to eyes, hearing relates to the ears, smell relates to the nose, and of course, taste relates to tongue. And then how about touch? Touch means the system's interaction, which relates to our internal organs and how the body works. So touch is not just touching, it's the interaction of all the body together. So that is the first five consciousnesses that we've been studying. We call it the first Vishnana, second Vishnana, third Vishnana, fourth and the fifth. Which nana? Which nana? We simply translate it as consciousness. And then we go on, of course, to cognition of it, which is the mano consciousness. That's the sixth consciousness. Perception is not the cognition. Cognition is the rationalization, the intellectualization, the analysis, the decision making. So the first five is only a reception, a perception consciousness. And then we have the ego proliferation, which is the seven consciousness. And in the Sanskrit language, it's the manas, which none. And then, of course, we go on to the store consciousness, which is the alaya, which none, the, the eight consciousness. So these eight consciousnesses include I, include me, includes you, that's you, that's me. And the Buddha said, study yourself in detail so that you know how your mind works. And this has been studied since 2,600 years ago. The Buddha touched on physiology and psychology 2,600 years ago. So let's, this is just a review. All right, then we've been studying it in nine modes, categories. We studied the, the, the how 
the, the first five perceive the world, how the first five consciousnesses get to know things, the most of knowledge, the moral nature of it, the realm is, of its activities, and then right now we are at number five. We already have spent a lot of time in one, two, three, and four. We spent about 30 hours, 40 hours uh, on one to four. Now we are doing concomitant mental functions. Um, number five, we're doing number five. Of course, after number five, we still have to do number six, seven, eight, and nine. Right now, we are doing number five. What is number five? Concomitant mental functions. That means when your first five consciousnesses interact with externalities, not just the consciousness, each consciousness itself interact. At the same time, there are some simultaneous, concomitant, mental functions that help this consciousness to to what to interact to express and these mental functions are hidden inside of you so if we can give an analysis example assuming each consciousness is a king so we've got five kings in there and all these concomitant mental functions are the ministers that help the kings to perform, to act, to speak, you know, to do all kinds of activities. And we need to study these mental functions because these are responsible for you, for what you have done, for what you have said, for all the karmic energy that you created. Uh, many of these ministers are really bad, bad ministers in this parliament Many of these are bad ministers, many are good, some are good ministers. All right, let's get into them. So, how many concomitant mental functions are there? There are 51. Now, remember, there's 51 in here, concomitant mental functions. Altogether, there are 51 mental functions. And out of these, the first five are omnipresent functions. That means it does not matter which consciousness is interacting with externalities. These always present, they always work, they always generally active, the first five. And the first five also, the first five consciousnesses also have this omnipresent, uh, omnipresent mental functions. And then there are contingent functions. That means sometimes it relates to certain uh, mental, uh, certain consciousness, and sometimes it does not relate to it. it. It's particular, it's contingent upon situations and objects. Uh, and then there are unwholesome functions, 26 of them. Unwholesome functions, we call them mental afflictions or delusions. There are six root delusions, eight primary delusions, and two medium delusions, and ten minor delusions. There are 26 of them. So if we're talking about ministers, there are 26 of these ministers that are unwholesome. And then there are wholesome functions too, 11 of them. And there are also four indeterminate, not sure. But in this case, the first five consciousnesses do not have indeterminate ones. They are determined. Your eyes, when your eyes look at something, your eyes determine to look at. Your ears, for sure, you look, you, you hear something. Um, your, your taste, for sure, tastes something. So out of the 51 total concomitant mental functions, only 34 are applicable to the first five consciousnesses. And just for interest, right now, uh, before we introduce the sixth consciousness. The sixth consciousness has all the 51 functions. Your sixth consciousness, the mono consciousness, contains the 51, all of them. But the first five, the, the, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, etc., etc., only have 34. And just talking about it, you may not know, but I already have talked about all of them in my first a uh, few se uh, sessions, because you need to know them in, in the first few sessions. But right now, maybe it's just good to regurgitate it, review it very briefly uh, for this session, so that you know 
one of these functions. So let's get to omnipresent mental functions. The first one is attention, the second one is contact. What is attention? The holding and thought of an object that has earlier been experienced, its function consists of keeping the mind on the object. That means the eyes have to pay attention to what the eyes are seeing. The, the, the ears have to pay attention for what the ears are listening to. So the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, and the body, the interactions. In other words, if your first five consciousnesses do not pay attention, then there's no consciousness. If your eyes are looking at, say I'm looking at a clock, and I'm not paying attention to what I'm looking at, the fact that I'm seeing this clock, the con that such consciousness is never created because I never have paid attention to it. So that's consciousness not created. You gotta have attention. But when your senses are interacting, your senses will pay attention to it. So the attention is so um, omnipresent mental functions. Is it good or bad? No such thing as good or bad. It's just attention. The second one is contact. Contact that means your, your sensory organs, the object of the contact and the consciousness, three of them are both created. Then there's such consciousness. There's a contact to it. The contact is the sensory organ, contact the object or situations, and then the consciousness is created when there is attention. In other words, if your tongue is eating, when you are very grief stricken, you're so sad, you don't know what you're eating. You don't have that eating consciousness because you're not, you don't have the attention to it, even though you have the contact. So all these have to be present, omnipresent mental functions. In order for the consciousness to actually work out, all these five must be present. And actually, if, if actually you're doing it, all these five are present. Sensation comprises the three types, pleasure, pleasurable, non-pleasurable, neither pleasurable or non-pleasurable. Sensation. Sensation is created in the process of, of the consciousness created. So you either feel pleasurable or you feel non-pleasurable or it's neutral. So when your eyes look at something, you like something, it's pleasurable. You hate it, you don't like it, it's non-pleasurable. Sometimes you don't have an expression, it's neutral. It's always this three nature. And they are named sensation because they are the causes of craving. There's something you like, you crave for it again. There's something you like to taste, you crave for it again. Something you like to smell, you crave for it again. Your body likes certain certain act, you crave for it again. You create craving. And that craving is the cause of suffering too. You crave for it. You attach to it. Perception, ideation, this is the aggregate of ideas. Uh, namely, the apprehension of marks such as it's blue or yellow, long or short, male or female, friend or enemy, and so on. It is that which grabs the marks of an object. It is the cause of reasoning and investigation. That's the perception part of it. You're perceiving it. When you're perceiving it, your eyes catch the marks of it. Your eyes determine, oh, this is blue, this is yellow, this is male, and this is female. So preliminary judgment. The eyes itself don't give full judgment. The full judgment belongs to the sixth consciousness. In other words, your eyes do not judge, oh, this is Mr. Chen that I'm looking at. Or oh, this Mr. Chen is a friend that I, 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 um, I met many, many, many years ago in certain occasions. You don't go to history. Your eyes don't go to history. Your eyes only observe the present marks. So your eyes only see that person. Your eyes don't say, this is Janet. And Janet is sad now. Janet is happy now. Or Janet looks beautiful now. Janet looks ugly now. They don't make the judgment. They just capture that marks and have a very preliminary differentiation. Uh, and the reasoning and the investigation would go a little further 
to the mind, to the, to the, to the mental consciousness, to, to the sixth consciousness. But there's got to be perception first before it goes to the sixth consciousness. So the last one is volition. Volition comprises evaluation such as decision making and action. Here an action is expressed through three general modes, bodily, bodily deed, speech, and thought. The karma of deeds and speech have initiation of action as the basis and thought has evaluation and decision making as the basis. So in other words, volition, it renders the, the thought creative, uh, uh, creative. It is a mental karma. Uh, the eyes, the ears, the nose does not have a, an in-depth volition. It is just preliminary. The in-depth volition goes to the sixth consciousness. But the eyes, the first five, has a little bit of volition into it, only the preliminary ones. So that's a general one. That's why we call it the omnipresent one. Now, so we have reviewed the five. So remember, it's attention, contact, sensation, perception, and volition. Now these are the five omnipresent mental functions that happen whenever your five consciousnesses are created in the process of your sensory organs get in contact with, with the objects. These are the five omnipresent, always present, simultaneous. All right. And then there are also the contingent ones. The contingent ones include the desire, resolve, mindfulness, or memory, in this case, concentration and intelligence. These are the next contingent functions that when your first five are interacting with externalities, these may or may not happen. They are not generally active. It depends on the situation. Rather than being active in every situation, they function only in regard to specific objects or situations. They are not directly associated with either wholesome or unwholesome or indeterminate because it could be any one of these. So let's quickly see what each one is, these contingent functions. First one, desire, desire for action. This is the liking for an undertaking. The, it is a mental function when one sees an object for which it holds interest and concern and hopes to desire it, it may be wholesome and unwholesome. So in other words, when your eyes look at something beautiful and you, you say this is beautiful and you, want, you would like to hold it, to get it, to, to steal it, or whatever, you robbed it, or whatever, desire it. Sometimes you may create that desire and sometimes you may not. Sometimes you may create a wholesome desire and sometimes you may create unwholesome desires. So this, this, that desire is your desire for an action. Your eyes, when your eyes see something pretty, may, then you have a desire for an action to obtain. So that's the next. You may not have that desire. Next one resolved is the approval. It is a resolved with regard to an object. It is the mental function that a determination has been made to pursue the object, holding to the certainty of it. Uh, the interest is intensified and stays for the object. You resolve to do it. You have that desire to, for example, you went into a shop, okay, and you saw something beautiful, and you didn't have any money, but you desire to get it, and you resolve that I must get it, in spite of the fact that I don't have any money. So you, you, you approve that you want to get it. And you desire to do something, some, a mis even at the expense of doing a misdeed, you want to do it. And you, you listen to something, you listen to some music, you desire to have that music, and you resolve that you, I must have that music. So this is contingent upon what you want to do. And then mindfulness is, you remember. Now this mindfulness is not the mindfulness related to the meditation. The mindfulness, you are very mindful. You remember a memory, a dharma, it, it, by, by virtue of which the mind does not forget the object, but cherishes it in order to 
to so express it. Mindfulness is that which enables thought to remember an object clearly, not to forget what has been done, is now being done or will be done in the future. It also applies to samadhi, to meditation too. You have your desire to concentrate on the breath as your anapanasati, and you want to do a concentration. That's on the good part. So in other words, your contingent mental functions could be good, could be bad. If your mindfulness is applied to meditation for concentration, that's good for you because you're creating concentration and mindfulness and samadhi. But if your mindfulness is concentrated on, I must, at the expense of stealing, you know, even by the action of stealing, by the action of, by all means, I must get this material I want. You know, it depends on which one, contingent on what. Is it a, a wholesome mindfulness or unwholesome mindfulness? It applies to tasting too. You want to you taste it. Uh, you want to, at the expense of killing an animal, killing a, a pig, a duck, you know, a chicken, you want to taste. You like the taste of fish. You want to go out fishing. You want to, you know, hook up the fish and, and bring it in and in the fishing part of it and then and you, and you want to kill that fish and then you fry it, you know. That's your mindfulness. You like the taste of it, which involves in killing it. Concentration, absorption of concentration. Samadhi is the unity of the object of the mind, that is the Dharma, by virtue of which the mind, in an uninterrupted series, remains on an object. Concentration is that which causes thought to be focused on the object. Focusing the mind on, on the same object constitutes samadhi. Samadhi does not exist separately. That means you have a contingent mental function, five contingent mental functions that are hidden in everybody. You desire to have it. You resolve to have it. You remember to have it, you concentrate you want to have it, then you have it done. Your karma is created. It could be good or bad. You desire to be a university student. And in your grade 12 and grade 11, you always be mindful. I want to, be, I want to go to UBC. I want to study for it. I want to take all the exams. I want to get good marks for it. I'm very mindful of it. So you resolve you desire to get into UBC to be a, a university student, you resolve that you must do it. You are proof of, of such an act that you will do in the future. And then you're very mindful. You went to all the lectures, you, you, went, you, 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 you studied, you put in all your time to study for it, you took your exams, and then you, um, you, you, you send in your applications, and you really concentrate on what you're doing. Finally, you su successfully, you get registered as a UBC student. You get accepted by a UBC. Then you're a UBC student. Because initially, you have that contingent mental function in you that you want to be it. If you have that successful contingent functions that you want to be a Buddha, and you're so determined, you're so mindful, you're close concentrated, you become a Buddha. Who do you want to become to be? It's all in your mental functions. If you think positively, then you do it positively. If you think it negatively, you do it negatively. How do you educate yourself? Do you know that you have this ministry to exist in you, in your parliament of mind, but you haven't utilized them? You, you, you tend to agree with the unwholesome ministers, and, you continue, you, and also you tend to agree with the unwholesome contingent functions. You don't, you don't get into the wholesome contingent functions. You want to be negatively con concentrated on what you're doing. And if you, are, if you are a political leader, you want to be negatively using your contingent functions to attack, to occupy, to possess another territories, then you wage wars. So you see the difference? All right, last but not least, the intelligence of it, the discernment. It is the function of the mind that makes the choice of accepting or rejecting the object. It could be a wholesome one, unwholesome one, it works only within the parameters. 
of the sixth consciousness, but also within the seventh consciousness. So in, in other words, this intelligence, contingent factors, is particularly active in the sixth consciousness. The intelligence do not happen in the, in, in the eyes. Such an intelligent the discernment. The discernment does not happen to the eyes, the ears, the taste. It only happens to the sixth consciousness, which is the mental consciousness. So these are contingent mental functions. We have learned the ten mental functions. The first five are omnipresent ones, simultaneous. It happens to every consciousness. It's present all the time in all situations. The next five is contingent, are contingent mental functions that may or may not happen, that may be wholesome or unwholesome. It depends on that person. So these are the ten mental functions that are always inherent in us. Right now we are only, do, we are only studying the omnipresent functions and the particular functions. It involves a lot of interpretations. Don't forget the categories. Don't forget the main topics. Don't get lost in the forest. This is a whole forest. Don't get lost. Uh, it's easy to get lost because you think this is complicated. There's 108 in some situations. So you see, sometimes I'm amazed at how the Buddha can present these things to, to us. Um, it, it's so systematic, so logical and it really follows your thought through. It, it's, it's like a course. It's like, a, it's like a, an academic course in, in your studies. Right now, okay, now, the first five consciousnesses have, have these two, right? And then the first five consciousnesses only have 13 of the unwholesome functions. The first five. And all the 11 wholesome functions and they do not have the four indeterminate functions. So the, the first five consciousnesses uh, are better than the six because out of the 26, they only have the 13. They don't have, they only have half of the unwholesome functions. And right now we have 15 minutes to go and let us examine what are the 13 unwholesome functions that pertain to the first five consciousnesses? And what are the 11 wholesome functions uh, that, that our eyes, our ears, our nose, our tongue, our body have? You know, what are these? Let's get into them. Unwholesome mental functions. So we have, we say, we have six root Delusions, very basic ones. The root, the root of all evil, we sometimes call them. The root of all evil. Some, some people say money is the root of all evils. Or, 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 or the urge for, rep, for, for fame and reputation is the root of all evil. But these are the root. Greediness, anger, ignorance, arrogance, doubt, and false views. These are the six root delusions that we all have in our consciousness because our consciousnesses are tainted are polluted they all contain these and uh, they are in two categories too some of them mostly are accumulated from the present life out of the ment out of, because of the background because of education because of the family background society background because you, you all have this some of these. And some of them are brought forward from previous births, previous lives. And to eliminate uh, the present ones, the present life delusions are much easier than to eliminate all those are inborn ones that have been accumulated from eons ago, from many, many lives ago. They have been brought forward to now in our consciousness. Those are extremely difficult to, to, to get rid of because they have been grounded for, for millions of years. So we need to study them so that we know them. When you're doing meditation, when you are studying Buddhism, when you're studying about life, you have to know your weaknesses. 
our weaknesses in order to improve. Needless to say, we don't just say, Buddha, you give me all the blessings. I want the best of the whole world. I want money, I want fame, I want health. I want everything to be the best. Yeah, you want everything to be the best, but you're craving for the worst. You, you, you feel with delusions in the process of getting them, you hurt a lot of other people. You create new karma. But the Buddha said, look at your basic, not a basic karmic delusions that are inside of us. Some of them, most of them, are inborn. That's the reason why when the baby was born, you think a baby is clean, like a, a white cloth clean? No. The baby already has a personality in there. Some babies react in different ways. Some babies have more jealousy. Some, people have le some babies have less jealousy. They're all different because their they accumulated inborn mental functions are different. Okay, and then, what are these primary ones? Disbelief, laziness, indo indolence, thoughts wandering. You think you cannot concentrate in your meditation? You brought that habit from previous life. You cannot concentrate. You brought that habit from previous lives. And torpor, when you sink into torpidity, sink into uh, dullness, forget, forgetfulness, distraction, uh, force, understanding. And you stick to that force understand, understanding. Now you also have shamelessness, no guilt, we call it the medium mental functions, unwholesome mental functions. The root mental functions are the, uh, the very grounded ones. The primary are the very inferential ones. And now this medium uh, mental functions also exist. Uh, we classify them as medium. Uh, shamelessnesses and no guilt. Uh, you are shameless, for example. You may not be perform something really uh, harmful to others. So they are classified as medium. No guilt is just a feeling. I have a feeling of no guilt. It does not matter. I never say sorry. Whatever I have done, I stick to it. I've done bad things, but I stick to it. I never have any guilt. That's, that's unwholesome mental functions. But they only happen inside of you, so that would be classified as medium. Now, what are these? Secondary ones. Hatred. Uh, vengeance. Hatred is express vengeance is hidden in you vexation jealousy harm parsimony you know what is parsimony you never want to give you never want to give out um, you always assess why do i have to give it out this is my money this is me but some people they, they, they really some people really want to give if they have a thousand dollars in their pocket, if they sell someone who need to, who need to be helped, they would give out nine hundred. They only retain a hundred for themselves. I remember many, many years ago when I was a child. I was at that time I was eleven years old, and this, uh, my junior school. Well, uh, I was in junior school. Um, I had to travel. I have to, I have to take a ferry, like. It, it, it's the same as like I, I was living on Bowen Island. I have to take a ferry to, to North Van to my school. So I had to take a ferry to my school every morning. I was 11 years old approximately. And one day, I, one morning I was on a ferry. Uh, the Hong Kong ferry, each ferry carry three, four, 300, 400 people. On, 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 the, on the passengers on, on the upper floor. And there's a lot of cars on the, on the lower floor. I was, I, was, I was sitting in there, I was hurrying, doing some unfinished work that I haven't done, my homework that I haven't done. I make use of the time to do my homework on the ferry because I was quite lazy at that time. I, I just, I always count on having my homework, doing my homework. And then when, when I was doing it, I look up and I saw a monk. A monk was uh, having a bow in his hand and is going to every passenger begging for money. 
A monk shouldn't be begging for money. A monk should be, should be going arms, arms around for food, right? Unless he was begging for money. But in my kind, small heart, I thought, this monk, he must get lost. He must be from mainland China. But at that time, there were a lot of mainland monks, uh, you know, coming from mainland China. They wanted to, to, uh, to get away from mainland China. At that, at that time, mainland China was quite relatively poor, underdeveloped. And many, many people rushed to Hong Kong. So I thought, oh, this monk, oh, he must have fled from, from mainland China to Hong Kong, and he was on his way. Oh, maybe he didn't have any money for, 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 for taking a bus or something like that. So every morning I was given by my mom a dollar and 50 cents for my lunch, a dollar and 50 cents for my lunch. And uh, seeing that a monk need the money, I gave him all the hundred uh, dollar fifty. It, nobody gave him anything. So when he came the bow to me, I saw looking at the bow. There was nothing in the bow. He was he was already going going uh, arms round to about hundred almost. I was sitting at the back. Was going almost a hundred and two hundred people. I saw nothing in the bow. I so I put the dollar fifty on in this bow. And I still remember his smile. He smiled at me, and I still remember. He didn't have any, any teeth in here. I still remember that gap, you know, the front three, the three gap was one smile. I, I could see a black hole in it. And that black hole still flashes in my mind, uh, even up to this day. So he didn't have any money. Nobody wanted to give him any money because they were so suspicious of monks going on arms round in the morning. And everybody was so tired in the morning. Some people were reading newspapers. Some people were just sleeping and dozing off. I was, I was hurriedly doing my homework. And then I look up and say, oh. I was actually watching since he started begging in there. So he didn't have any money. So I gave him all of it. I was 11 years old at that time. And what happened to my lunch? I tried to borrow from my friends. <laughs> I borrowed 50 cents from here and 50 cents from there. And I get a dollar fifty. I still have my lunch, and I have final to pay back. But at that juncture, at that moment, I didn't want to. I didn't think about my own lunch. I just thought about maybe I should give it to that monk, who didn't have any money for for traffic, for traffic, you know, for transportation, you know. Uh, so I just give it out. And later, I found in sutras that if you if you really give to a monk who is really in need, you have a lot of blessings. I found it out later. And that's the reason why I became a monk myself now. And, uh, and also, I, I didn't have any, I'm really, not, I, I, in my life, I'm really, I haven't been really short of anything. I really haven't really been very poor, you know. And, you know maybe that's the reason, that's cause and effect. So that's, Parsimony is some people never want to give up. I can see a lot of people who, who have this kind of problem, parsimony. Uh, many, many years ago, uh, we, we, we gave our lunch, you know, uh, Chinese or whoever you are, uh, at lunchtime. And I said, it's free, but you, you, can, you can give any money you want. You can give donations. And sometimes we really give a good lunch, you know, have good food. And you know what happened? And then after they eat their food, and they deposit money into the box, donation box, and sometimes, at one, one day, they, they didn't give in anything, and they didn't drop in any money in the box. So I, I heard cling, there's a cling in there, and I was interested in how much money that person dropped in. 25 cents. I mean, the lunch is worth more than 25 cents. You ate a lunch and you only drop in 25 cents. <laughs> so you must have, you know, uh, despised the lunch. Nobody would give in a 25 cents for a good lunch, would you? If he was forced to do a hamburger, he would give him a dollar fifty. How much is a hamburger these days? How much is a hamburger? Eight dollars? Eight dollars, maybe about 12 years ago, it could be about four dollars, right? A hamburger is worth four dollars. Uh, I remember that lunch was quite a good lunch, and he only put in 25 cents. Cling, 25 cents. He didn't want to give. He's so parsimonious. So parsimony, pride, concealment, flattery, and deceiving. So these are the secondary ones. And in 
the first five consciousnesses, there are only 13. The five consciousnesses do not have all these 10. Uh, no. Because all these 10 secondaries, why are they called secondary? They're called secondary because the, the, be, not because they are unimportant. Because they are so hidden, so subtle. The eyes do not have hatred. The eyes do not have, the ears do not have vengeance. They don't have vexation. The, ear, the, the, the tongue do not have jealousy. So these are so subtle, so unnoticeable, so skillful that only the mentality, only the six consciousness have all of them. The eyes do not have them. So that's the reason why they're not included in the eyes and wholesome mental functions. All these 10, they don't exist in the eyes. They only exist in the mind, in the ment mentality of it. And they exist, they're so skillful, so subtle, so unnoticeable. You have a lot of jealousy that you may not know. You're so parsimonious that you may not know. You don't want to give out. You have so much pride in you, you're so proud of yourself that you may not know. You have a lot of flattery in you, you do not know. You're so, you're so egoistic, you may not know. Because they're so skillful, so subtle. All these, all these, now also, the eyes have greediness, anger, ignorance, and arrogance. Uh, uh, ignorance. Remember, out of the 26, the, uh, the, the first five consciousnesses only have 13. So you drop 10 right there. So where do you drop the other three? The eyes do not have doubt. The eyes just capture the images. The eyes do not have false views. The ears do not have false views. The, the eyes do not have arrogance. Your tongue do not have arrogance. So you drop arrogance, doubt, and false views with the first five consciousness. So altogether you drop 13, right? So what do we have? Let's go get back to the very beginning. So the eyes, the first five consciousness, only have this and this and these. And then you ask, how can the eyes have shamelessness? This shamelessness and no guilt is so slight in the first five consciousnesses. They are very unnoticeable. They, they may not even exist in some situations, but they have a little bit, according to the um, uh, study of the consciousness, they have a little bit of those. So these are explanations of all these, of all the mental functions, the root mental functions, the unwholesome mental function, the meaning of them, what's the meaning of laziness, thoughts wandering and all that. We already have explained it in many sessions before. The first five consciousnesses, um, have the 11 of them, the wholesome ones. Faith, shamefulness, guilt, uh, no greed, no hatred, no ignorance, diligence, joy, equanimity, no indulgence, indolence, and no harming. Now we have, these are the good ministers that, that are in our consciousness. In other words, we're not all bad. We're not all negative. We're not all, you know, uh, um, hopeless. In our mind, we also have the good ministers. It's just we have the bad ones, more bad ones than the good ones. Why? Why do you say, how come, you, how come the Buddha said we have more bad ones than good ones? Because if you have all the good ones, you are not in this world. You are in the second level of the world. Our existence is in the lower level. There are better ones, there are better existence, sentient beings than us. They are in the Rupa Dattu. The apparent characteristics, uh, as far as karma, karma energy is concerned, in the level higher than us is, they do not have the sensuous mental afflictions, which we have. In other words, in that world, there's no such thing as relationship. In this world, we think relationship is important, but in this world, it's, it's the relationship, is. The, the relationship between male and female that get us into this world. In the higher world, they don't need that anymore. They only have one gender. If, we, if there's a gender exists, 
Gender exists only when that is sensuality. Only, but in that in that level, there's no no such thing as gender. No man and woman. No such thing. That is a higher level. And then, of course, there's another higher level. So the reason why we have more unwholesome mental functions, the mental function is because we have done all these unwholesome acts. That the reason why we went into this world. This is the the karmic world, the world of desires. Okay, there's、uh, four neutral or uncategorized mental functions. They don't exist in the first five consciousnesses: drowsiness, regret, investigation, and scrutiny.、Uh, they have. They don't have drowsiness. They don't have regret.、Uh, drowsiness. This is one. We are full. When we are dull-minded and confused and cannot accurately cognize things. If you sleep. In order to ease the body of meditation, that is wholesome drowsiness. If you oversleep, that is unwholesome. Sometimes drowsiness does not refer to sleep, but to the function that occurs at a time of falling asleep. So drowsiness they don't occur in the first five consciousnesses. Regret. There's two kinds of regret. You feel regretful of things that you have done wrong, and that is a wholesome regret. But sometimes you feel regretful of things you have done right, that is unwholesome. Uh, regret. Uh, let me give you an example on this. You come into a, a charitable organization, and then on that day you are particularly kind. You you feel happy. You feel very compassionate on that day, and you want you 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 went into a a charitable organization that you you, you like so much.、Uh, that organization care for children, for example, or or care for、um, handicap. Then you feel so like it. Then you have、uh, you, on that day you have so much compassion. You wanted to give out in your bank account. That you have say ten thousand dollars. So you were so pleased, and then you want to give out five thousand, half of it. So you you, you donate five thousand to a charitable organization, and then you got you you gone home. And then you call up your 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 friend. You say I donated five thousand. Oh, are you stupid? You were doing five thousand. You only have ten thousand to friend out. You donated five thousand. You know how much is five thousand dollars? You immediately feel regretful. Oh yeah, I should kick myself. I shouldn't have donated five thousand. After all, I don't know what they do with the five thousand. They may spend all the five thousand in administration. Oh, I should have. I shouldn't have done it. I should only donate about five hundred. Why should I donate five thousand? You feel very regretful. On on the compassion you expressed at the time of donating, that's an unwholesome regret. When you have done something good chari- cha- on charity, you don't regret on it. You don't regret on what you have done. But you have done the wrong thing, you regret on it. That's wholesome. You know, I have scolded someone. I feel regretful. That's wholesome because you you a regretful feeling is a wholesome feeling. On the things that you have done wrong, or the things you have done right, and you feel regretful about it, is not a wholesome regret. Investigation and scrutiny, it could be wholesome or unwholesome. They refer to functions that rely on language to further clarify the cognition object and deepen investigation of it. This affects the volition and intelligence and lies within the mental or the mano consciousness. So the first five consciousnesses do not have this. Uncategorized mental functions, indeterminate. They're indeterminate. So, getting back to the first slide that we have, we have studied concomitant mental functions that happen simultaneously with the first five consciousnesses. The total concomitant mental functions, there are 51. Out of the 51, only 34. Only the the first five consciousnesses. Only have the 34. So that's how we study the mind. We study the mind, our own mind, in detail, so that we know what we're doing.、Um, that's Buddhism. That's one one sect of Buddhism that studies the mind, and that's called Vijnana Matrata. We'll carry on. We still have other other categories that we have to study. For example. 
uh, the categories, what do we have? We have, we have next time we'll, we'll, we'll study the necessary conditions, preconditions. There are conditions for the first five consciousness to come true, to act, to behave. And there are also uh, how does each consciousness function and how do we transform our tainted consciousness into enlightenment according to what the Buddha taught us. How do these five consciousness can lead us to enlightenment? These five consciousness could be doing bad things that lead us to hell. But at the same time, they could be, be, could be doing good actions to, to lead us to enlightenment. Don't blame your consciousness. Don't say, my eyes are bad, my ears are bad. They are tools, but you have used them wrongfully. You use them to steal, to kill, to commit sexual misconduct, to do all kinds of bad things. But the Buddha said, turn around. You could utilize them. To, you can transform them utilize these tools to see good things, to listen to good things, to do good work. You are the master of your own senses, but you haven't mastered them well. Now you should learn how to master them in your meditation, how you slowly master your senses. Why are you taking meditation? Because just of good health? Just give you peace of mind? You learn how to master your own senses. That's what the Buddha taught us.